women may say men are shallow. Okay, but women don't date men who are shorter than they are. I don't need a man, almost like they want a man to be subservient. They might say that's what they want, but that is probably not what they want. I had a friend who was on uh, hormone replacement therapy. Dude, I'm telling you, women are holding it together. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? When did you start learning about this and masculinity? I mean, you went from, like, kind of share with me what your story was when you yeah. were a younger guy and then, you know, you kind of found fitness and you said, yeah. okay, I'm going to go get a PhD and learn about nutritional sciences. Like, how is the connection between, you know, teenager lane to now very awake, emotionally aware lane? Yeah. So growing up, uh, I was a very, I had ADHD, very like hyperactive, goofy kid, uh, real sensitive, you know, like I had great parents. Like I, I really, you know, when they're talking about how people become people pleasers or tend to have trouble setting up boundaries, usually they're talking about like people who had parents, they feel like they had to caretake for and that sort of thing. I didn't like, that wasn't me at all. My mom is like a, your typical Midwest woman who's a little bit like, you know, She's a little bit hard driving and it has a little bit of anxiety, but like a great person. My parents always told me they loved me. You know, there was never love withheld, that sort of stuff. I had a really great childhood in that aspect. But then my experience with my peers was really horrible. You know, really, really. I mean, I probably didn't get like picked on that much worse to start with than a lot of other kids. But I think because I was sensitive, it was like, you know, if you ask them to stop, it just means they're going to do it more you know, Mm -hmm. and it really escalated throughout the course of, you know, all the way from probably second grade all the way up until, you know, my senior year of high school. And, you know, I did find that like when I made the baseball team, it, it kind of improved, you know, so I could see like, oh, you know, if I did something, people were, you know, would like reward that. Right. And, um, I also like started lifting weights, uh, purely because I was like, all right, you know, if I'm going to get picked on, they're going to pick on somebody that's bigger than them, more muscular than them, and uh, maybe I'll get some attention from the girls. And it, it didn't really fix either of those problems, at least initially. I would say like lifting weights eventually helped with those things, but it was more so because I just got more confident, not because of like gaining muscle, that didn't make me more confident, but through the course of that and pursuing and striving, I came up against setbacks and plateaus and things I had to get through. And as I got through those, it just gave me a lot more confidence to the point like, you know, I'm pretty much the most confident guy when it comes to competition day. In fact, in my world of powerlifting, I'm known as somebody, you don't want to let me close because I'm going to win. If you let, <laughs> if you let, if I'm close, I'm winning. Um, you know, like I, at Worlds, I went up, I uh, was going up against a three-time world champion uh, from Mexico. You know, we, we were heading into my, the person who handles me on meet day. So kind of helps me pick my attempts and, you know, just get me focused. His name's Ben and he's been with me for 10 years now. And uh, my best friend, Mike, came to that world championship and he'd only ever seen one powerlifting meet before that. And going into deadlifts, which is the, so for powerlifting, for people who don't know, you do squat, bench press and deadlift and uh, you get three attempts at each. You can never reduce your weight that you attempt. You can only increase it. So if you miss something, you can't go back. You can only go up. Uh, So you do have to be pretty strategic with things. Anyway, going into deadlift, I was down. Uh, 33 pounds or 15 kilos. And Mike, Ben thought he couldn't hear me. I thought I couldn't hear him because I had my headphones in, but I had them turned off. And Mike's like, what's going on? Like, how's he doing? And Ben just looks at him and like smiles and goes, he's going to win. Watch. <laughs> and uh, that's what happened. So like, it wasn't the gaining muscle or getting stronger. It was the fact that like, I went through, you know, so many hard things. I've been through all kinds of injuries. Like I don't want to rehash my lifting career, but like I've I had two herniated discs in my lower back. I've had two bulge discs in my lower back, two herniated discs in my cervical spine. I completely tore my right pectoral, which had to be surgically repaired. I partially tore my left pectoral. I partially torn muscles in both hips. Like I've, I partially torn my left adductor. Like I've been through the ringer and I've always come back. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think when you do that kind of stuff, it just like gives you confidence that you can do more hard stuff. So gaining that confidence really made a big difference to me, but it's so funny, like when you, when you get into relationships as you get older, you never realize like until you're in them. And I didn't have many growing up. And I think that was one of the hard things is like the first actual long-term girlfriend I ever had was I married her, like my first mm-hmm. wife. Mm-hmm. And then my second person I ever dated 
I married them too, you know? And then, <laughs> so I was like, I never really had that experience, you know? And you realize like, it is so triggering to be in that because you feel very emotionally vulnerable. And like, you just come up with like, you're making assumptions about what the intention behind what they're saying. And they're making assumptions about what the intention behind you're saying. And so I started in therapy in 2016. I really think that like, I've been, you know, pretty consistently going since then. And I really think it made me not just aware that, hey, there's another prism that everybody views the world through. They all have their own prism. Yep. And your prism may not be the one true prism, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that really helped me get to, like, it's okay to get to a point where you may disagree with somebody, but you come to an understanding. Where would you, because mental health is, is a complicated subject when it comes to men, you know, there's a lot of men that don't necessarily believe in therapy. Uh, there's a lot of men who don't think therapy would be helpful for them. And there's a lot of men that have gone into therapy that, and they feel that therapy has failed them. So what would you say to men, especially in my audience, as far as what was it for you that kind of you said, okay, I need to go into therapy. You know, what has been the biggest takeaway for you? And like, how would you encourage men? Let's say you were coaching them or you were, they were on your team and they were on your lifting team and they were going through something like, what would that conversation look like to encourage them to get into therapy? Because of course we have all the, we have the lovely Andrew Tate of the world. And I sometimes get pegged into that space. And I'm <laughs> Yet now, um, I'm actually going to be taking on some red pill stuff because I think that Good. they need a voice. Yeah. I, I stayed away from it, but my, you know, now my coaches are like, "Hey, you know what? If you can't beat them, then join them." And I'm like, "Okay." Sure. You can be you can be pro men without being anti women. You know, yeah. like that's that's the thing. I, I think. Um, you make a really good point. I think one of the things is honestly, like men are afraid to share because they have the experience, and if they're vulnerable, it gets used against them. What? It, and I hear that so much, but like. Tell me what that means. Cause I, I can't tell you every day there is a comment that says I weaponize my emotions. And I'm like, give, give women specific examples of what that sounds like. Yeah. So I know like uh, in previous relationships, like I, I had like, for example, uh, this happened multiple times. I had mentioned how like how my grandfather was like the most important person to me. You know, so my grandfather was like a world war II vet. He had multiple bronze stars, a silver star. He just like, had the most integrity of anybody I ever met, you know, just um, a wonderful person, like the funniest person I ever knew too, like just hilarious. And I always said, if I grew up to be half the man my grandfather was, I'd be happy. Well, multiple times in different relationships, you know, during you know, conflict, there had been something like, well, your grandfather would be so ashamed of you or, you know, that sort of thing. And it's like, mm. here you go, you're being vulnerable about something oh. and now it's being thrown back in your face, right? Mm. Or... You know, you might say something like, you know, I don't always feel like I'm doing the best job for my kids. Like, you know, I think every parent has that feeling, you know, mm. um, and then I would have it thrown back in my face. You know, you're a bad father, mm. um, you know, th those sorts of things. So, you know, I think that that's like um, that that's where like then you start to put your guard up. You know what I mean? Like, is this like is this a are you wanting to get to know me or are you wanting like a hammer? You know what I mean? It's like this, this Intel gathering. Why do you think women do that? Why do you, what do you, what is your perception of that? I, I kind of have a, an idea, but I'd like to hear. Yeah. You know what? I, I don't, you know, I think people in general probably do it. I'm sure yeah. there's men that do it too, you know, no yes. question about it. You know, I think people are really bad at managing their emotions when they're triggered. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things that like I've tried to do over the last you know few years is if I know I'm triggered, you know, I'll, I'll just be like, listen, can we discuss this another time? Or can I have some space? Or can we do something to de-escalate this right now? Because like, I'm feeling very nuclear. I, I can remember, well, you know, <laughs> I love that word. One particular instance, I said, you know, can you please back off? Can you please back off? Because like, right, like, I know where this is heading right now. And if you, if like, we could just revisit this at another time, like that would be great, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and unfortunately like that didn't happen. And of course, you know, it led to a, a big fight. Yeah. Um, Cause what do they say? It's never about the thing you're arguing about. It's about a bunch of other stuff, you know, typically, mm -hmm. you know, so, and, and to be fair, like I've, I've, I've done the same thing. Like I've pressed on the nerve, you know, when, when like somebody asked for space. So I, I think that people are just really bad at managing that. I think uh, if I had to like 
you know, really like give an appeal to men to go to therapy. One of the things I would say is the therapist matters. Okay. It's not just, mm. well, go find somebody who's qualified and that's it. I think there's probably a little bit too much of the, like, obviously you don't want to be best friends with your therapist. Right. But I think a lot of therapists hold their clients at probably too much arm's length. Like I want to, like my best coaches I've ever had are people that I respect and I want to make proud. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And I think if therapy is going to work well, the person kind of has to like trust the process and buy in. And you're not going to do that with somebody that you like, like aren't a little bit invested with. And, you know, my first therapist is actually a really good friend of mine. Now we, we don't do therapy together anymore because of that. I still will, you know, she's my friend, so I'll talk to her for counsel. Mm -hmm. um, and Patty was my first therapist. And one of the things I liked about her, she was very, very non-traditional, very straight down the line. But the thing I liked most about her was if I did something right, she would absolutely heap praise on me, gush all over me, tell me how great I was. And then if I screwed something up, she'd be like, you screwed this up and don't give me your excuses. You know? <laughs> And, but that was great for me because I know that any criticism in that situation is coming from a place of love, mm. you know, but I've been, um, and the same thing, like my best friend, Mike, he's that way. Like I, I, I know Mike, you know, like friggin' loves me and he will say like the nicest things to me. And he's like one of the most successful people I've ever met. But then if I screw up, you know, I remember I went, I went, I came back from a trip one time and I'd been like killing it on this podcast tour and I get back. And I walk in the door and uh, to his house and he's like, all right, before we talk about anything, we got to talk about some stuff. Let's sit down. And I'm like, I didn't get a hug. You're like, what's going on? And he like goes through five points that he wanted to talk to me about that he felt like I hadn't been doing well. And we talked about it. And he's like, all right, now give me a hug. And, you know, so, but like, I know, I know when it comes from that, it's coming from a place of love. And so I would say like, really don't just find therapists who are, who are not going to challenge you. Like, how can you possibly grow if they're just going to say, well, that must have been really hard for you. Right. Oh, I'm so sorry that happened. Yes. Well, how did that make you feel? Like that, the, 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 that just seems like, honestly, that's probably why a lot of men feel like therapy is a waste of time. But like, if I'm going to therapy, I'm going because like, I don't know the best tools. I don't mm -hmm. know how to do this myself. So please don't just have me talk about how it feels. Like give me actionable things to do, like yes. things to practice, yes. you know? And that's the biggest thing I coach men from a, from a select psychological perspective, because it took me nine, I believe, and I kind of, I don't know if I should be admitting this, but it took me nine therapists before I found the one, right? I call him the one. Uh -huh. uh, and he, he kind of remind. there's a, a term in the therapy world called transference. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a, a representation of a, a child, you're kind of viewing them as a parent. He looked like my dad. He kind of sounded <laughs> like my dad. It was a little freaky, the beard, the height. And he told me, he admitted to me, he's like, I, I kind of used that in the beginning to really gain your trust because I was so lacking of masculine energy and trusting of men. I'd been so hurt so many times and I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know what the cycle was. And so when I met him, you know, I, I was kind of, you know, tiptoeing into it. And then when that trust just hits, there's so much powerful work that can be done. And he, the, the problem with therapy, unfortunately, and this is why a lot of people leave the profession and go to coaching is just, they are so bound. They are so tied up in the red tape of therapy that they really have to abide by so many different rules. And that's why I tend to people, my, my therapist has left the profession at this point because you can't really have a therapeutic relationship with someone when there is a wall between you. It, you mm. can only get so far. And then the number two thing is that I talk about this often on my platform that I, I sometimes feel that m mental health and especially therapy is designed potentially for more women to be, to appeal to more of that feelings. Let's talk through things. Cause when women talk through things, oh my gosh, we feel better. We've diffused ourselves. Somebody understands our feelings, but I, I truly believe that men need actions. Like they need, they always come to me and say, Sarah, what, 
tell me what to do. Like, I'm just looking for a solution. And that is a huge thing I think that we need to address, especially Men's Mental Health Month. Like, I'm going to talk about that and on how sometimes I feel that therapy, we need to look at it a little bit from a male and female perspective. We are all are people and we all have childhood traumas that are similar <laughs> to one another's. But at the same time, we need to address the problem and fix it from a male, female perspective. And then the second thing you said that was so crucial, and I learned this so big with men, was they really, I don't know about you, but you said it like positive reinforcement, right? You, you oh, want yeah. to feel as though, okay, I'm doing something right. I'm doing something good. So that when you have feedback and when you're not super happy, it comes from a place of trust. And it's like, okay, well, yesterday she was really happy with me and all these things, but there's just an understanding with men that I think they respect it more. I don't know if there's, like you said, there's just, you know, that they're, you're going to be supported and they're doing it from a place of, I want this to be better versus if a man just is constantly hammered and there's no reinforcement. And I don't know if you experience in that you're in your relationships where it was just constant negativity all the time. You start yeah. to feel berated, let down. And, and I, I don't you know feel like you can't do anything right. So why try? Right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think, you know, I, I said for a while, like I kind of felt like an offensive lineman, you know what <laughs> I mean? Like you're only, you're only getting identified when you're doing something wrong, you know? And I think, um, I think that happens for a lot of men. And I think women in particular are like, will be very effusive with praise at the beginning of a relationship. And everybody does this for, for mm -hmm. some, some way or another. Mm -hmm. But at least in my experience, it's been more so like women will pull back on that much more than the, at least like non-toxic men. Like I, I know like, you know, I would still say, hey, thanks for doing that, you know, or you look really nice tonight, you know, you know, that sort of thing. Like I would always make sure to say that And if they did something I liked, I would make sure to like effusively tell them because to me, I mean, this is going to sound bad, but like training people is no different than training a dog, right? Like mm -hmm. if they do something you like, you positively reinforce that, right? Because you want them to keep doing it. And so it kind of felt like whenever I, you know, there have been many times in my life where I felt like I do something that they said they wanted, but then there was no praise. There was no, nothing to reinforce that, you know, and then there was only the criticism and, you know, when people only criticize you, what tends to happen is you either just get really sensitive to the criticism over time to where anything feels like criticism, or you just completely shut down and you stop caring about what that person says. Yeah. And neither of those two things are going to be helpful in a relationship context. So yeah, and I, I think a, a lot of men have, have experienced that. And I think it's, again, it's like, um, you know, for us, you made a really good point about like women it, it helps them to talk through their feelings. And this is one thing I didn't really understand until recently. And I was talking to a friend of mine because I was explaining some things that I had. And she was explaining some things she had. And she said, you know, I don't need somebody to fix it. Like if I can just, if somebody will just sit with me while I'm upset um, and not like, not try to dismiss it or explain things away, just let me be upset for like a few minutes. She's like, after a few minutes, I'm just not upset anymore. Like I've just gotten out of my system. And I think, you know, that's very different for men, at least in general. And mm -hmm. me, I'm like, okay, how do we fix the problem? Like this thing, this action is the problem. So how do we not have this problem again? Mm -hmm. And and for us, know, uh, for us, the feelings are the problem. <laughs> right, right. Well, I think- um, You feel uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that's where like the, the classic example of like the, have you seen the video of like the woman with the nail in her head? Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> so this, for those who- yeah, for those who don't know, there's a, a video, like this woman has a nail sticking out of her head and she's like, oh, my head hurts. And the guy's like, you have a nail on your head. And she's like, you're not, you're not listening. My head hurts. And he's like, but, but you have a nail on your head. And she's like, you're not listening. And he's like, but we could just pull the nail out. And she's like, no, no. you know, so, and then finally he goes, I'm sorry, that must be really hard for you. She's like, thank you for listening. You know, like. <laughs> It's and it seems so, the end of the video and the end of the video is like it's never about the nail, <laughs> right? Right, and, and 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 that's the thing. And I again got some really good perspective on this, which was I think like I would approach things in a relationship of like, okay, I don't ever want to do that again because I don't want to hurt that person, right? So I'm not, I'm just not going to do that again. And the reality is like you are going to hurt the person you're with, 
Like it is impossible to not do it. And 99% of the time, you're probably going to do it without even realizing you did it. And with no, you didn't mean to do it. Right. So this idea that like, you know, from a man's perspective that we could just stop like hurting our partner, or upsetting our wives or our girlfriends or whatever, not possible. Yeah. But what you can do is like sit with them in the emotions and that will help them repair better. And that's something that I probably did really poorly because my immediate, especially like in relationships where I felt criticized a lot, Mm -hmm. my immediate go-to was like, well, this is why I did it because of this thing. Not necessarily like gaslighting and putting it back on them, but just like trying to explain my mindset. Mm -hmm. And the reality is if like somebody's hurt, it doesn't really matter what your mindset was. Like you still need to like help them repair. Yeah. And and unfortunately, being a, I call myself a feel like women are a feelings organism and we experience just so many more highs and lows. And I think sometimes it's it's difficult for men to be like, wait, why, why are you feeling this way? So, it's like Sometimes that we don't know. Sometimes it just is a, so much and we don't even know where these feelings come from. And that's something that it's just hard for, for us to really put it, you know, we don't know how you can be so logical and so for- factual. For perspective on this, I had a friend who was on uh, hormone replacement therapy mm-hmm. and he, he comes to me one day. He's like, dude, I'm telling you women are holding it together. I'm like, <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? And he's like, my estrogen got too high and holy crap. He's like, I was just crying at random stuff. I felt like I was like, and then somebody slightly like something that would slightly annoy me. I felt like I was going to flip out. He's like, so I'm telling you women are actually holding it together right now. He's like, I'm so impressed. And then by the same token, I had another friend who she was, she had clinically low testosterone and uh, was you know taking a small dose of testosterone for it. And they got her dosage wrong and her testosterone got too high. And she's like, men are holding it together. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, I want to hump everything that moves. <laughs> well, and that's why you'll hear women, you know, I'm in my late thirties and yet there's that joke, right? Where women are experience a little bit more of their sexual prowess in, in this time in early 40s. It's because I believe that we have a little bit more testosterone or there's we're losing our estrogen. There's some imbalances that are happening already, like perimenopause. And and Correct. I will say, I'm like, wow, you know, I I get it now, guys. It it's it's a it's like a desire that you just is uncontrollable. It's like you just gotta you it's like a thirst it's like food you just got to eat so i it i think it's just hilarious you know men and women are it's funny i always say like god it's a joke that he decided to put us together (laughs) um so i want to get your take on this the masculinity space in general because again i think that i look at you as just such a healthy representation of of masculinity and then you know we have it's kind of these dichotomies that are happening in the space and people are really hurting. I don't really know how it even got to this point, you know, dating. And there's so much from COVID that we're dealing with from an aftermath standpoint. And of course, you know, we have some of these, I don't even want to call it toxic masculinity because I don't really even like that phrase. I think, you know, it's just a, a misuse of masculinity and power, but what would, what do you, what do you think about all this? And like, how do you talk to men if they come to you? Cause I get a lot, I get a lot of men that have kind of are wanting to kind of graduate from that space and they've been angry and they're like, all right, I, you know, we hate, I hate women, but now I want to understand, you know, what I did wrong. And they, they kind of go through an arc of, of their own growth. So what, where do you think like the masculinity space is and, and what's your kind of opinion on it? First off, when people say, Oh, women are this or men are this, I'm like, come on guys, like like every single person, you know, like, come on, you know, or I'll see these comments on like these, you know, unfortunately, like you, you, you talked about, like, you're going to kind of take on the red pill movement, which I think is good because I'll get some of that stuff suggested to me. uh, And I'm like, Instagram, this is, uh, you got a wrong read on me. (laughs) Um, And I like, I'll every once in a while, I go through and read the comments and it's like, oh yeah, all women are this or all women really want this. I'm just like, (laughs) Hey, uh, so if the same thing keeps happening over and over to you in relationships, what do you what do you think is most likely? You know, mm-hmm. um, there is a common denominator here, mm-hmm. and like that's something I asked myself after two divorces. You know, like okay, you know, in one of those relationships, I felt relatively strongly that you know uh, I had some very good reasons for leaving, and 
you know, but that's still like, okay, I was still part of that. I was part of that dynamic. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and even if it was one of those things where I should have left, uh, and actually one of the reasons I was angry with myself is because I felt like I stayed for way too long. You know, looking back, it was like, okay, well, why did I stay for too long? Because nobody had a gun to my head, right? And it turns out like a lot of that was just tied up in like guilt, shame, you know, that sort of thing or expectations of other people, you know, like, so that that's still on me, you know? And I think when it comes to like toxic masculinity, everything is a two edged sword. Everything that can be used for good can be used for bad. Mm -hmm. So there's some great things about masculinity, which is, you know, taking charge and, you know, having the desire to, be a breadwinner and earn a good living and, you know, take care of the family and be a protector and all those sorts of things. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the things that I, um, I think is funny with what I would call, maybe I'll call it toxic feminism, right. Which is, well, I don't need a man, you know, almost like they want a man to be subservient. And I'm like, okay, there may be some women out there who are attracted to men who are meek and subservient, but I sure haven't met them yet. I can tell you that. Like they might say that's what they want, but that is probably not what they want. And I think it's, that's okay. Like it's okay to have preferences. Like not everything has to be equal because I think the important thing is like overall, as human beings, we value, value each other equally, but people are not equal in terms of like, hey, I can deadlift over 700 pounds. That's not equal to another person, but another person might be able to take a tumor out of somebody's head that I would never be able to do that. I'm not equal to them in that aspect, you know? And so I think, but that doesn't mean we both don't have equal value as human beings. Mm -hmm. And so I think like just approaching it from that and like, why can't we lean into this stuff a little bit more? Or if a woman says, you know, I do value a man who can make a good living. Like, why is she, why, why should she be denigrated for that? There's nothing wrong with that. Right. And as men, like when people say, well, men just care about looks. Yeah, I care about looks. Yeah, for sure. No question about it. Like, Fortunately, I've done enough therapy to where it's not the only thing I care about anymore. But even like, you know, I'll say, okay, so women may say men are shallow. Okay, but women don't date men who are shorter than they are, like mm -hmm. almost as a rule. Like there are couples who, you know, have, the man is shorter, but it's very, very rare. I think it's like less than 1%, something like that. So again, like, the, but that's okay. Like, it's okay. You're allowed to have your preferences, you know? Right. Um, and I think that, like it's like the yin and the yang, right? Like if men and women were the same, maybe they get along better, maybe, but then we probably wouldn't get so much cool stuff in the world. Like, you know, my mm -hmm. friend Brian Callen, he's a comedian and he has a really great skit talking about how he's he's talking about the, the same person that created the giraffe is not the same person who created the rhino. Mm -hmm. He's like he's like, uh, you know, it's like my friend Stan, you know, he would be the one. He's like, my friend Stan is gay and he would be the one to create the giraffe. I'm like the neck, stretch it out, make it eight feet long and put polka dots all over it. You know, <laughs> like, whereas like me, I create the rhino, you know, give it, you know, horns and armor plating and two speeds, zero and screw you, you know, <laughs> like just, but like those things are okay because like the differences between men and women, I think are where like, a lot of like who knows what the world would be like if just men were like all like if everybody was like masculine right you know god we would probably be in, involved in a whole stuff slew of stuff we don't want to do and who knows where we'd be if it was all you know women and feelings you know probably not a lot of stuff would get done you know but we we might all be happy seeing kumbaya you know yeah, I think it's the the demonizing of of either gender that really is the kicker for me. It's the demonizing of the attributes that the other gender is upset about, and it's like, you guys, we are both we both have our preferences, and and that brings me to the next point. You know, I would say that being a pretty woman versus being a woman who doesn't get as much attention, you know, that woman has to, I'll tell you myself, I was an ugly duckling. Like I was a tomboy. I used to be a mix race bike with my brothers. You know, I did not have the girly influence. Uh, you know, I was probably 25 before I started to get any male attention. So I had to really work, you know, it was my personality that I, that I was kind of the funny, I became the funny girl. That's why some of my skits are just <laughs> my B plus sarcasm, but 
you know, I became that girl. And I think it's important for men. I want to touch on that because I think what happens is that men do get kind of attracted to that beauty, right? The, they, they get starry eyed and then start to forget. And, and that's one thing I work with my clients on is, is let's like, look at who is she as a person? Like what is underneath there? They get blinded by the light. Then they fall in love. They stay I'm not surprised when things don't work out because that woman potentially didn't work on herself or her personality because she didn't, she didn't necessarily have to, if she knew if a woman is on the side of the street, right. And she gets a flat tire and she's pretty, a lot of times she's going to know that there's someone who's going to stop. Right. And who's going to potentially rescue her. I talk, tell the story all the time. So a lot of times those women don't necessarily have, if you don't have to work at something, if you never have to learn how to change a tire, then why would you? Because you know, you're going to get rescued. But with men, there's a, there, there's not nine times out of 10, you're changing your own tire, unless you got a really nice guy coming over to help you being a good buddy. But a lot of people are intimidated by that. So when did you kind of decide, okay, all right, those two marriages didn't work out. Now I probably need to start looking for some other characteristics. Like I'm attracted and I still want to sleep with them, but like what else is there to the relationship that's going to make it successful? Yeah. I think it was one of the first things I thought about, to be honest, was, okay, like what's the, like, of course, one of the things I would want on my list is for somebody to be attractive, mm -hmm. but it's also like previously I like, I found people attractive and then we had something we shared, right? Like they were a common interest, that sort of thing. But that's not the same thing as values, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think like the biggest thing is making sure you have shared values. And just because somebody has different values than me, that you, doesn't mean they're unethical or bad values. It just means that they're different values, right? Sometimes they can be. But for me, like one of the first things I did was after this, you know, past marriage was, okay, write down what are the, the absolute must-haves? Like where are my absolute non-negotiables going in? right? Okay. That's there. Putting that in stone, right? And no, that list should be very short, right? There should be most things you should be flexible on, but there should be a few non-negotiables. So mm -hmm. I put those down. Then I put, okay, so those are like my needs. And then what are my wants? Like what are my values that I really want to have in somebody? And that list is much longer, right? Mm -hmm. And so if they're missing one, two, three things, okay, no big deal. Cause if they've got, you know, eight, nine, 10 of them, nobody's perfect. And if they've got most of it, that's what I'm concerned with. And then I also thought about like, what do I like to do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Because if you've got somebody like, you know, I like going out and going for hikes. I like going out on my boat. I like going out and doing, doing stuff. But I also like to like chill on my couch every once in a while, you know, like for the most part, mostly during the week, I like to chill on my couch after work's done. Um, if I got the kids, you know, that sort of thing, maybe we'll get in the pool. But if I'm with my partner, like I just want to chill out for a little while, de-plug, you know, talk about the day, whatever. And it doesn't even have to be TV. It could be something else, but just something kind of low key. But then if you're with somebody who it's like they feel like they got to be doing something all the time, that's going to be a conflict that's hard to navigate, right? Because you're always going to feel like they're trying to spin you up and they're going to feel like you're kind of lazy, you know, or vice versa. And so like, the other thing I thought about was like, okay, you know, wanting to find somebody who like at least on a day-to-day -day basis, like our lifestyles kind of fit in a line, you know? And I think a lot of people maybe don't give like thought to that, mm. you know? And then also like, what are my idiosyncrasies and stuff that I'm scared to show people? And here's why I'm going to show them right up front because why waste time? You know, obviously like some things you don't do like fart in front of somebody on the first date, you know what I mean? <laughs> but you know, like I heard something from a, another guy I follow, uh, Matt Pfeiffer, and he said, uh, rejection is protection. Mm -hmm. And I never, the way he brought it out, I just thought was so brilliant, which is if you are who you are, your authentic self, and somebody rejects you, they're actually doing you a favor mm -hmm. because in order to be in a relationship with them, you're going to have to suppress parts of yourself that will only lead to you being resentful in the long run. And so mm -hmm. that relationship isn't going to work or you're going to show your true self eventually. And then that person is going to be resentful because you sold them a bill of goods, you know, mm -hmm. which I did all that stuff, right? Like I tried to hide parts of myself. And then of course, like when those parts came up, the other person got upset or in another case in a relationship, I just suppressed those parts for a long time and then I got resentful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like that's, that, that part of it's on me. 
-hmm. And so like, I think that's one thing I really have tried to like, remember is like, okay, you know, if I go into a date or something like that, okay, am I scared of saying this because they might get upset? Like, is it something that like is part of like is telling the story is like, or whatever it is, is it, is it kind of part of me? Like, is it fit with who I am? And yeah. if it does, then let's put it out there because this is my filter. You know what yeah. I mean? So that's kind of how I approach things. I think that so many men, oh, that is probably the number one thing that we have to work on is they're so in their head. How is this? Because men don't get as many experiences as women, I think, unless you are, you know, top dog, alpha guy who's making whatever money, you know, men get these experiences and maybe once or twice a month and they just, there's so much pressure and women can feel that pressure. They can tense, they can feel when you're nervous and, and it's like, it's okay. You know, it, it's okay to be nervous and have nerves when you're meeting someone new. But if it's, it's what I learned, you know, is it's actually you're, you're manipulating, right? You're kind of changing your stories to fit the other person. And then when you can't keep that facade up, the relationship just has no chance because it was built on, you know, lies or just hiding stuff. And I think I get the pressure from men because like, I've never been on a dating app. I, I have yet to have that experience. I don't really want to have that experience, but, um, so much. you know, one of my, a friend of mine, uh, she's an attractive female and uh, she like, she was like, yeah, I, I got on there, you know, the first time I signed up and I think I got like 5,000 swipes or something like that. I'm just like, I mean, that sounds like a lot, you know? Yeah. And so I think if you're an attractive female, I mean, there is always going to be a market, you know, you're going to have a lot of options. They may not, a lot of them may not be good options, but you're going to have a lot of options. Yeah. Just being an attractive dude doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a lot of options. Um, yeah. You know, maybe initially you will, but they'll filter out pretty quick if you don't bring something else to the table. Yeah. Well, I think we could talk so much longer and I love the conversation. I know that this is a little bit different than what you usually talk about. So I appreciate I appreciate your support. Um, I appreciate that you are a man who's willing to talk about mental health and how important it is in this space. Now, as far as your prog programs go, what can my, my audience, what if they wanted to start a, a training program or wanted to get in the gym, you know, kind of tell them a little bit about what you offer and uh, your coaches. Sure. So, I mean, we do everything. So I, I, um, for those that don't know me, my Instagram is BioLane, and that's kind of my digital business card. And you can find everything I sell from there. But we offer one-on-one -on -one coaching through my team of coaches, Team BioLane, which um, are evidence-based coaches who we have personally handpicked and trained in what we call the BioLane way, um, which we produce uh, long-term sustainable results based on scientific evidence, no BS, no nonsense, no fad diets. And then we also have an app called Carbon Diet Coach, which uh, basically is uh, a coaching app that does similar things. You know, obviously an app isn't going to give you like emotional support and behavior change, you know, stuff, but our app will basically like give you nutrition protocols to follow. And then we'll adjust those protocols based on how you respond. And the app's only $10 a month. So it really is a great option for people who maybe can't afford coaching or aren't ready to go to that level of commitment yet. And we have tens of thousands of members on that app. Uh, then we do have training programs we offer through our website, biolane.com. That's $12.99 a month. And you get access to all our evidence-based programming. We have a research review on the site as well, where basically like I take complicated nutrition research and, and break it down in a way that's easy to understand. And I have a, uh, a supplement company, Outwork Nutrition. And then I also offer, uh, for people who want to be nutrition coaches, I offer courses on how to become like an evidence-based coach. So, wow. so that's a uh, one-stop shop. So yeah, we, I do it all. I do it all. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. We got great feedback on all of our services and products and um, we're only looking to make those things much better even in, in the in the near future. Awesome. All right. Well guys, this has been an amazing conversation from a physical standpoint, mental health, uh, getting into the gym, getting those, getting those hormones checked. It's all part of, um, you know, all part of maintaining a healthy lifestyle and being healthy. So thank you so much for the conversation, Lane, and I'll see you on Instagram. Sounds good. Thanks, Sarah. Appreciate it.